stars they wept The morning sun was dead The Savior of the world was fallen His body on the cross His blood poured out for us The weight of every curse upon Him As heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake, the storm was rolled away. Perfect love could not be overcome Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated Hidden 
glory in creation And now revealed in you are Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is
shake The storm was rolled away His perfect love could not be overcome Now death, where is your sting? A resurrected King has rendered you defeat Out of Manuel Baptist Church, the church that loves God and loves people pure and simple. Whether you're watching us online or you're here in person, we want you to know that you're a part of the West Side of Manuel Baptist Church family. We're glad that you're here this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you in God's house as always, and we're gathered here together as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to worship Him for all of His blessings and His goodness. And his faithfulness. So if you would stand with us at this time as we sing, Your Grace is Enough. Grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me.
So thank you for joining us this morning. Would you look around you? Would you find somebody, maybe high five them, hug their neck, or just kind of welcome, greet one another in the Lord this morning, amen? As you're doing that today, I want to say a huge word of, uh, of greeting to uh, Stephen and Denise and Amy and Keith and Sheila, Yvette, Janet as well, Melody and Andrea, all the way from uh, Gulf Shores and Marie and Tambra. So we've got a lot of folks that are watching online. Thank you all for joining us. Would you take a moment and be seated this morning? I have a couple of quick announcements before we take a moment to recognize our graduates. We are so thankful for them and who they are and their families that are here with us today. One of the things that you need to know is tonight we actually have a business meeting at 3.16 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And so I know that you're really excited about that, but that'll be tonight at 3.16. And so, uh, so it's just a way for us as a church family to gather together to see what's going on behind the scenes of all that takes place here. And so we welcome you to, uh, to join us in the Fellowship Hall today at 3.16. Next Sunday is going to be an awesome day, a great day. One of the things that we want you to know of is that we actually have a chicken dinner fundraiser. And one of the things that we're doing is that it helps to send our little kids to camp. Right now we have 43 of us that are going to children's camp and so it'll be a great group of folks and we're looking forward to that but your participation in that actually helps us to send these children um, at a rate that's affordable to them and their families and a lot of them are actually paying the full rate but that helps us to send them and so thank you for joining us for that. If you have not signed up yet then, um, then we only have 150 available. Uh, we're about, uh, about halfway there and so if you haven't signed up yet and you want that, it is Brother Bill, it's a chicken half, right? Not we ain't skipping out on a quarter and stuff. You're getting a whole, whole half of a chicken. And, um, you know, so there's baked beans and potato salad. And those of you who've already, like, agreed to do baked beans and potato salad, you need to holler at me after this. Um, but if not, make sure if you'd like to say, oh, I make a mean baked bean and potato salad, then let us know that and we'll, uh, we'll add you to that list as well. Um, also, the other thing I want you to know is that next Sunday morning, um, all of those 43 kids that are going to camp will actually be up here on stage. They're going to be leading us in a song next week, and so be praying for them and their leaders uh, as they get ready. They've been working on it. If you haven't seen some of our adults uh, post their kids reading these, it's just been an awesome time to see them uh, make that happen. And so before we uh, close out, if you are interested, like I said, in, in taking part in the, uh, the chicken dinner next Sunday, it's carry-in or dine-in, or carry-out dine-in, whichever one you want. The sign-up sheet is actually in our Welcome Center. In the Welcome Center as well, you'll see some information about uh, what's going on in the days ahead. And one of the things that you'll really be blessed by is this is that there is a, uh, there's some West Side t-shirts in there. And so if you're interested in getting one of those, picking one of those up, they're all in the Welcome Center. You can do that on your way out. If you're new here, you may be wondering, well, how do I give and participate in what's going on here at West Side? You're able to do that. Those of you even online, there's a link online. But you're able to do that either through giving these boxes or there's a little QR code in front of you. And that'll actually send us to a, a website where you can sign up for the chicken dinner, some other things. And so that's all right there in front of you. Just take your photo app, go ahead and open that, and you know, it'll tell you what to do after those things. This morning, I'm so thankful as we gather together for what the Lord is going to do. And so we're going to recognize our graduates here in a moment. But before we do, as brother, go, no, come on up. I was going to have you come up. Um, I'd like to just have us uh, join together for a moment of prayer, and then we'll continue. Father, thank you for this morning, this time together. I thank you, Father God, for each person who's here and those online as well. And, and Father, during this time, as we gather to worship you, we know that your grace is enough, that you have showed us through the very love of Christ what it means to come here to know you. And so as we celebrate with these graduates today, we are thankful for your presence here and even though the presence that has brought them even through this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, good morning. Let's give the Lord a clap this morning. Amen. So this morning is a very special Sunday for a select few, few graduates in here, so... I'm going to call them up, and, and then my wife is going to, you can just line up on this second step. 
Our first gra graduate this morning is Miss Claire Edwards. She graduated from Franklinton High School in, in top 10 of her class with a 4.16 GPA. <laughs> Scholarships totaling more than $62,000. She is a baby magnet and is willing to hold anyone's baby at no charge, <laughs> which means we could use you in children's church. She loves reading, listening to music, swimming, taking naps, and going to the beach. That is Miss Claire Edwards. Our next graduate is uh, Mr. Kevin Green. He played soccer for 10 years. He has a pet bearded dragon, and he starts college in the fall. Mr. Kevin Green. Our next graduate is Miss Anna Martin. Her parents are Frank and Penny Martin, and she has five siblings. She has always had a passion for music since she was a little kid, and she is attending Level College in the fall in pursuit of a bachelor's degree in worship ministry. That's Miss Anna Martin. Hello. Our next graduate, the preacher's kid. <laughs> she loves anything and everything from Taco Bell. She has received two scholarships offers from colleges to play basketball, and oh, she plans. Really? <laughs> Bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she plans on attending Southeastern Louisiana University to major in kinesiology. That is Miss Sylvia Rosa. <laughs> Our last graduate is Miss Cameron Sill. She is going to college, but still to this point, she has no idea what she's going for. She loves going on vacation to visit local restaurants, but she is completely against fast food. And she is a natural mother to her family, her parents, and anyone else around her. That is Miss Cameron Seal. And so, I just want to read a verse this morning. It's probably the, the most uh, used verse for youth, but it's 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And so just the short few months I've had with these seniors, I, I've seen this in these, in these guys. I've seen the love they have, just the pure hearts they have, and the faith they have. And so I would ask this morning uh, that we could recognize Mr. Riley Passman, uh, Mr. Dalen McKenzie and Mr. Caden Lewis, they were not able to make it this morning. Some of them had drill and were just had other things going on. So there were some other seniors. At this time, though, would the parents and maybe siblings of each senior walk up and stand just to the step below your graduate, please? The parent and maybe siblings. And while you're doing that, the preacher's kid has something to say. Okay, so Drake asked me to say something to all of the graduates, but of course, me being me, I had to wait until less than an hour before church to prepare it. But to my fellow gradu graduates, we are about to embark on a new journey full of ups and downs and everything in between. We will face many new trials, but God already, already knows what's in store for us. Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. God has a plan for our life. We just have to be willing to trust him through all of it. Don't allow college and future plans to distract us from what God has in store for your life. Keep yourself surrounded with people who uplift you and keep you drawn closer to God. And don't, slow, don't let anyone steal your light. Let others see Christ in you, even when it's hard. This next chapter of our lives will be challenging and scary at times, but with God, all things are possible. Trust that God's plan is far greater than yours and everything else will fall into place as it should. And so while we're recognizing the graduates this morning, I want to recognize the families and just the discipleship they've had in their lives and the impact they've had in their lives. And so could we give them also a clap this morning? <laughs> and so I'm going to pray, and then when we're done, you guys can be seated. Father, I come to you this morning. Lord, I thank you for the families. I thank you for the graduates. Lord, I thank you for just giving me a short time in their lives to be able to disciple them and mentor them. Father, I pray as they go to college and they go to work or whatever it is that they're doing, Father, I pray that, Lord, that they would just live by 1 Timothy 4.12 and commit their lives to you and the Bibles that they were given this morning to, to use that every single day and, and follow the, the instruction manual for life. Father, we love you. In your holy name I pray. Amen. 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 
Well, amen, as they're being seated today, some of you may have recognized and realized the, uh, the last week um, we heard this young lady sing this song, and you know this song, but when we heard her and we heard the, uh, the passion and the love for Jesus that she began to sing this with, it was a really blessing, and so, um, so we asked her immediately to come and, and join in leading us today. And so I'm going to ask Khalees to stand right here by me, buddy, just right, right here. And as we join together, would you stand with us as we sing this song? You sing it to Jesus. This is your family. So we're going to sing it together this morning. Amen. Let's sing it together. You walk it down 
Stay right here before you're seated. There's no what? Let's sing that part. There's no... Shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me Come on, sing that together now. There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up no shadow you all light up, mountain you all climb up, coming after me. No wall that you won't kick down. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you all tear down, coming after me. No the overwhelming. Oh the overwhelming, never ending. Reckless love of God. What does it do today? Oh, it chases me down, fights till I found leaves the 99. I couldn't earn Why not? it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming. Amen. Amen. I'll go ahead, be seated. Might as well just be seated in the house of the Lord. As you're seated, though, we're going to invite our little ones to be dismissed for Children's Church. Appreciate Lee and Kenzie helping us with that. And so as those little ones are making their way out of here, as they're making their way out of here for Children's Church, listen, church family. You are teaching these little ones how to worship. On Wednesdays, I hope that they're learning how to worship so they can actually teach you as well. And so it has been a huge blessing as they make their way on out of here to, uh, to spend that time with the Lord. Hey, sweet London girl, good to see you, man. You know, as we, uh, we gather together um, for just a, just a moment, I want to, uh, to remind our graduates. And so, um, so thank you for that. Uh, up in the balcony, I know that some of y'all may need some, um, some tissues and stuff with, uh, with uh, Kalisa's family. If you listen for a moment to the, um, the rowdiness of that, uh, that youth group there, um, they, they are a family, and I really appreciate uh, the ministry of uh, not only Brother Whalen for the years that he's been here, but appreciate Brother Drake as well, because 
because they are establishing something in there that it is a God movement. And so we're just so thankful for what the Lord is continuing to do um, in the lives of our, our young people. This past week, as we, uh, we get ready to uh, celebrate all these graduations, even, even girls who are ballers, shot collars, you know, uh, appreciate you telling your dad, like, you know, uh, I may have said, no, 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 Southeastern. Let's go, you know, I want to see you play some more. But the reality is, the blessing of that is, um, we have heard all these graduation speeches this past week. At Franklinton, they had this thing, and, and um, I don't know if any of y'all remember the, the Franklinton graduation speech. It was about Dora the Explorer, right? And so, I mean, it was like, it was legit. I know that changed your lives just listening to that. You know, we had some other folks who were talking about like mountaintops and everything, and so I don't know how many mountains were mentioned in y'all's and said, I mean, there's a whole lot of different mountains that, you know, you're going to have to climb over and pass through, and ain't no mountain high, ain't no valley low. Ain't no river wide enough, baby. I mean, you know, a lot of things that they were learning even at their graduation. A lot of things going on. Here's one thing that I've noticed, though, is that oftentimes, anybody remember what it was like to be 16, 17, 18? Some of y'all graduated at like 20. Anybody remember that age that you were in those times that you were trying to figure, like, what would I become after I graduate? What would my life look like? Anybody doing now what you thought you'd be doing when you were an 18-year-old? Is that not, you know, you thought, I mean, you know, some of y'all are. It's like, man, I knew what I was doing when I all my whole life. But some of y'all are like, no, this is not the path that I thought I would take. But sometimes your life is like a puzzle. And we've been looking at this whole idea of the finding the missing pieces of the puzzle of your life. And today, as we, we look forward, I want to, um, to speak a quick word into the future and then we're going to come back in a moment and look at what happens in our past. The whole idea today is I want you to, to make peace with your past. But before you can make peace with your past, I want you to realize that there is a future that God has intended. We're going to be looking in Genesis chapter 19. You can turn in your Bible. Uh, we'll, we'll read that here in a moment. But Genesis chapter 18, 19, there is graduates. And we got you two guys singing here in a moment. There is this whole idea of a man by the name of Abraham. And he had a nephew by the name of Lot. And Abraham is the father. Abraham had many sons, and we sing this song even on Wednesday nights and stuff. You know, we try to go old school sometimes, and so, you know, had many sons, and let's all praise the Lord, right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, you know, and then turn around, sit down. We, we do that whole, whole deal. But one of the things that we've learned about is Abraham was a man of faith. He had a nephew by the name of Lot. He, he, he loved him a lot, and so... Um, Okay, all right, never mind, oh, but, but <laughs> you, you'll get that later on. That was a really funny joke, dad joke number one on the pages for this morning. But his nephew had a decision. They were both doing really good for themselves, but they were, they were farmer kind of guys, and they, they were taking up too much of the land, so they had to split company. They had a decision to make, which way do we go? And Lot actually chose the better portion, even though he really should have given that choice to his uncle. And so what ends up happening is that Lot goes, and he, he did this. He pitched his tents. He, 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 they lived in tents. They were nomadic kind of people. Right there in this place called Sodom. You've heard of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, that whole study and, and story of, of what's going on there. But he stayed right there. That one decision to live there in that place, in that area where Sodom and Gomorrah, it changed his entire future. One decision changed his entire future. Teenagers, those of you who are graduating, those of you who are like stepping out on whatever your future is about to hold, you need to realize that sometimes one decision can determine all of your future. Anybody here like still paying the repercussions or the benefits of a decision that you made and now it is still lingering and lasting? Well, all of a sudden, because Lot decided to get real, real close to this place called Sodom, he ended up not only getting close to there, but over time... He got a little bit more comfortable with this wicked place. He got a little bit more comfortable, and he actually became one of the leaders at the city gates. Here's what we want to realize, though, today. We realize today that sometimes we can't get over the decisions that we have made in the past. And so I want to help us today. As we are finding the missing piece, how do we find the missing piece to making peace with our past? Because some of you came in this morning and you are dealing with some of the things that have gone on in your past, the decisions, the good, the bad, and the ugly of your life. And so sometimes we cannot make peace with our past, except for one way. There is a God who stands with us in the middle of the fire, the trials, and the tribulations of our lives. And so today, what I want to encourage you to do is, as you hear Anna and Sylvia sing, that in the middle of our lives, and would y'all just make your way there, in the middle of our lives... We have to realize that God stands with us, moves with us in the middle of the fires and the trials that we go through. And so would you take just a moment to, uh, to hear this song as we celebrate today?
Amen. I appreciate uh, both of you singing that for us today. Uh, Coach, good to see you this morning. Appreciate you being here, my brother. Glad that you're here. Look, as we get started today, what I want to do is, if you could turn in your Bible again to Genesis chapter 19, we're going to look at this whole idea of making peace with our past. Whatever has happened, the things that are passed on, those things that are behind you, those mistakes and shame and regret, Genesis chapter 19. When you find that in Genesis chapter 19, in honor of the Lord and his word, would you stand with me as we read God's word together? Chuck at home and Stacy and Evelyn, uh, y'all stand with us too, Ms. Lori as well. Uh, Genesis chapter 19, starting in verse 17, here's what the word of the Lord says. So it came to pass, when they brought them outside, that he said, escape for your life. These are angels talking to Lot and his family. Do not look behind you or stay, any, or stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. And if you skip down Genesis 19 to verse 26, listen to what the Bible says there. But his wife looked back behind him and she became a what? A pillar of salt. Father, we're just so thankful to you for your word. Just pray, Lord, that you would speak to us even right here at this very moment. That God, for those of us who may be trapped and, and consumed and, and continuing to carry on our past, that God, even today, that this might be an opportunity that you would set someone free in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated as you're seated today. So this woman could not get over her past. She could get, not get over the things that were going on in her life. She could not get over all of those situations and circumstances that she had uh, held on to. She could not move forward. She was stuck in her past, in her pain, in her shame, in her regret. She just could not move forward. Forward. She could have had life. She could have had God's blessing. She could have walked forward. But because she turned around and looked back, it meant that she could never go forward again. She could not get over her past. She could not make peace with her past. Now, Mr. Prince, I want you to know today, whether your name is Aviana in the back and stuff or whether you're up here at the front, I want you to know today that this is the truth. As a pastor, I've dealt with and talked to so many people over the years who could not get over their past. Preacher, if you knew the shame and regret and mistakes that I've made, I've dealt with those time and time again, and they can't get over that. If you understood how I wake up at night with, with regrets and, and mourning the losses and decisions that I've made in the past and the way things in my life have worked out, they cannot get over their past, the shame, regret, the things they just cannot get over. And the reality is, if you cannot today make peace with your past, then you're always going to be stuck back there. You will be immovable. You'll be like a pillar that cannot move, and you'll be stuck in the dead places, those lost places, those places that God says you should not be. And so as we look in Genesis chapter 19, there's some advice there that I think will help you and I to, to move past every single regret and shame and mistake and, and past thing that is in our lives. In Genesis 19, there's some stuff that can help us here. Here's the first thing I want you to see is this. This is going to be profound. This is going to be like one of those moments where it's like, really? That, that is just wow. Here's the thing. The past has passed away. Isn't that just like, wow, really? No, no. Think about it for a moment. Th that word past, past, P-A-S-T or P-A-S-E-D, P-A-S-S-E-D, the reality is that thing is something that is no longer here. It is no longer something that we carry with us. It is something that is dead and gone. There's a reason why it is called the past. If you look in Genesis chapter 19, verse 12 and 13, we see what was in this woman's past, the things that are already dead and gone. These angels come to her in verse 12. They came and said to Lot, have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons or daughters, your, whoever you take to the city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Now, you may not know the backstory of why the angels are coming to say, hey, get out of Sodom and Gomorrah, because we're about to destroy this. You may not know the story of what is happening here. The wickedness of that place had gotten up to the Lord, and there was a great outcry in the land about the wickedness that that was happening in this place. Let me tell you, for instance, how we know how wicked it was. Abraham, the, the man of faith, had these angels come to hear the Lord's word that says, we're about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, Lord, what if there's like 50 people in this city? Will you destroy the entire city if there are 50 righteous folks in there? And the Lord's like, I won't destroy it if there's 50 in there. What about 45? And then he goes on, well, what if there's 40 people in that city who are righteous? Will you destroy it then? He goes down from 40 to 30 to 20, and then he ends up by saying, what if there's 10? What if there are 10 
righteous people in that city. Will you destroy it? And the Lord says, no, even for the sake of 10, just 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, I will not destroy that city. That's at the end of chapter 18. In chapter 19, though, we see these angels come to the city because obviously there were no righteous people in that place. I'll tell you how bad it is. Lot is sitting there at the gate. That was the place where they talked. They, the, the men of the city would come together and they'd make financial decisions, political decisions, uh, rulings on uh, judges would be there at the, at the city gate. That was the most important place. Everybody would come there. Lot had now moved from a tent into a house and now he was right there in the middle of the city. When he was there in the city, he sees these two men come by. He bows down low before them. When he bows down before them, he says, look, would you like come and stay with me in my house tonight? And these guys said, no, we're going to stay right here in the center square. We don't want to go into your house. And he begs them. He says, no, lords, we want you to come in. He realized there was something special about these guys. Now, here's the craziness of the city that they are in. The new guys come into Lot's house. They go in there, and then at nighttime, they hear this beating on the door of Lot's house. And Lot hears this beating, and then he looks outside, and the men, the oldest and the youngest, they're surrounding the house, and they're beginning to beat on the door. And you say, why are they beating on this door, trying to press into this house? It's because the men of the city notice these two visitors that came, fresh meat in town, and they literally say this, we want these men, bring them outside because we want to sleep with these men. That's the weakness of this city. And so all of a sudden, Lot comes out, he, he comes and he slams the door behind him and he says, guys, look, you know, what are you here for? What's going on? They tell him the reason. And he says, look, I'm going to make a bargain with you. You can tell the, the depravity of even Lot's mind at this time. He says, look, I have two daughters. They've never been with a man. I'll give you them to you. You can do with them whatever you wish, but leave these guys alone. These guys said, no, that's not what's going to happen. We're going to come and we're going to take these men. You know, who are you, the judge, to judge us for anything that we're going to do? And so they come and they try to get him. And all of a sudden, the angels come. They open the door. They drag him back inside and they blind everyone that's on the outside. You want to talk about wickedness and depravity? You want to talk about the reason why God was willing to destroy this city. It wasn't just because of the, uh, the sexual sins that they had. And if you've ever realized this, sexual sins will get you to the point where you're never quite satisfied. You, you, you have this certain high, and then you need the next thing. You have this, and then you want the next thing. So that's the way that sin works. And you know what? When, when it comes to this whole, I mean, we, we, we have a, a, a law at times. It's called sodomy. It's based on this city. And so, you know what? I don't, I don't want to uh, get this twisted in any way. And I want you to realize that we as a church, we, we love people. We love sinners. That's why some people have even worn that shirt that says the sinner's church. And so we realize that, you know what? We want to be open and welcoming to you, no matter who you are, what you have gone through. But listen, friends, sin is sin. God is God. His word is always going to be true. And what he calls sin, the reality is we want to welcome you here into this place. But if God gets a hold of you, he will change your life. And so the reality is the Bible says, look, if God was willing to judge someone like Sodom and Gomorrah, that reality is he still is in judgment over a nation that says that is something that we ought to tolerate, that is a behavior that we just find acceptable. God is still God. He is still a just God. And just as much as adultery is a sin, just as much as homosexuality is a sin, just as much as gossip is a sin, just as much as any of those other sins are still sin. Why? Because he's still God. And if he was not going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah, then he needs to go back and apologize to those folks because he destroyed an entire city, what was going on there. And so listen, friends. We welcome you no matter what you have been through, no matter what you're going through, but God won't keep you that way, amen? God will change your life, amen? So, so we have to realize that that is what happened here in this place, and so God was willing then to judge an entire city because there was not even one righteous there in that city. God was going to destroy it. Here's the problem. This woman... Look back, and that was her home. She was comfortable there. They knew people. That was her folks and, and everybody there in that city. And so she had trouble letting go and letting go by realizing that the past had passed away. Can I give you a word of advice today? Some of y'all today need to stop living in the dead places of your past. Stop living in the dead places that the Lord is going to destroy. You see, some of us are holding on to things in our past, and we're holding on to those things, and the Lord says, hey, that thing is dead and gone. That thing is past. The way that you used to live your life, the way that you used to act, the way that you used to do things, that stuff ought to be in your life dead and gone. It ought to be no longer be a, a part of who you are. Sinful ways, old relationships, those things that you've held on to, the shame and regret. The Lord says, hey, it's time to get out of those past 
dead places. There's a reason why the past, it's called the past, and it ought to, it ought to just go ahead and, and die there in that place. Why, why are you and I still wanting to live in dead places? Can I ask you that? Why, why are we wanting to live in dead places? Now, now listen, there are some folks here at this church, and you may be new here, and those of you watching online, there are folks here at this church who tried to get me into a tent and go camping. Now, I don't know about you, but that ain't, that ain't, that ain't my flavor, all right? So I don't want to go out where there's snakes and bugs and you got to zip yourself up and stuff. I don't, Colby, that's just like you, you're a good tent camper kind of guy. I don't know if I could do that and stuff. And so, especially one of the places that, you know, we went out to the church yard. That's the last time I went tent camping in the backyard of the church. I put a table in front of where the head of the bed was, where we stayed in there and stuff. And I put a table there because in case somebody wanted to come and slash me, they had to go through the table first. Had my gun with me and everything and stuff, you know. What ends up happening, though, is in the middle of this tent camping experience, I have this table by our head in order for us to, you know, you got to come through the table to get to my, my head and all. But the cat didn't know that that's what the assignment was for that table. So the cat jumps up on the table. He jumps up on top of the tent. And I'm like in the middle of the night kicking and screaming trying to get this cat that I thought was trying to kill me, get it off of me. I'm not all about that. I'm not only not going to go camping in the, 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 the church backyard, I definitely am not going camping in any cemetery. You see, the reality is, I don't need to be in there. I don't, you know, I know there's dead people there and stuff, but I don't need to go even, I don't, I'm not pitching a tent right there in this cemetery. Why? Because there's dead folks and there's things that can happen and I don't need to be in there. And it's always people that are like my color that get killed first. And so I'm not doing that in the movies. You know, I'm not, I'm not playing in that direction. Why then, why then do we say, you know what, I'm not going to pitch my tent inside of a cemetery. But y'all do that every single day when you want to live in the past. When you want to go and stay there, you want to live in that dead place. You want to stay in that regret and shame and things that the Lord said, that, that thing is dead and gone. It is passed by you. Stop living on that. Stop harboring all those resentments. Stop living in that anger and frustration of your past. The Lord says, look, if you are staying in that cemetery, it is time to get out of the dead places of your life. You see, this woman could not get past that. She knew that the Lord said, I'm going to destroy that. I'm getting rid of that. That is something that is no longer in your life. But she could not let go of that past place, that, that dead place in your life. I've been to many funerals, many cemeteries, many times of just gathering together. And one of the things that is oftentimes on a headstone, it says these words, rest in peace. Let the past Rest there. Let it stay there. Don't resurrect all those dead things that no longer need to be a part of your life. And so here the Bible says, you know what? The first thing that you have to realize is the past is dead and gone. It is meant to pass away. And so if you keep on living in those past dead places, don't be surprised when you get stuck in that place as a pillar of salt because you can't let those things go. Here's another thing that we learned, though, from this, this lady and this family. The reason why it's hard to put past the rest sometimes is because look what it says. Lot lingered there far too long. I don't know if you saw that in this part of the story, but Genesis 19 verse 15 says it this way. When the morning dawned, the angels, they, they urged Lot to hurry. All right, that's what it says in verse 15. You get this picture. It's about to happen. They're urging him. There's an expediency about this thing, and they're urging him to, to come and, and get out of there. They're urging him, and the morning dawned, they're hurry to say, arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And so the angels are going to, to Lot and saying, hey, 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 it's about that time. Hey, hey, judgment is coming. Hey, it's about that time. You better listen to me. Hey, hey, this is about to happen. And so you better, you better check your watch. And the time is, is coming close. And I'm about to judge this place. And during all of that judgment that was happening and bound to happen, look what the response is of that man. He says in verse 16, and while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the two of his daughters, the Lord being merciful to them, and brought him out and set him outside of the city. Ooh, Lot loved him some of that place that he was living in. He loved those past dead places. He, he knew folks there. It was comfortable there. That was a place that he just said, like, you know what, I belong. And so all of a sudden, the judgment of God is about to fall, and what does he do? He just kind of lingers. You ever been caught lingering somewhere? Anybody know what that word linger means? Oh, I ought to get out of here and stuff, but it's about to get to popping. And so I ain't about to go home now. I got to see what's going on. I, I linger. 
Oh, she gave me that look and stuff, and I know what that look means, and you know what, this might be a good time to kind of put my hair back in a little bit and stuff, and this is, I, I, need, to, I need to linger here. Oh, if I make this business decision right here, I know I could, you know, I could, I could, it might get me in trouble, but I could, I just need to, to linger. And I imagine that some of us have gotten in more trouble lingering in our life than we care to admit. Because this is what this man did. Instead of leaving, instead of rushing, instead of leaving that place right away, the Bible says that he just kind of lingered in the middle of those times. We, we linger a lot in past places. You say, what does that mean? Oh, you ought to have forgiveness in your heart over that thing that happened to you a long time ago, but you like to kind of linger right there. I ain't letting that go. I'm not about to let them off the hook. And so what do we do? We linger in that dead place. Oh, I, I know that this is a sin and God doesn't want me to do this and it's, it's, having a, it's wreaking havoc on my life, but I'm, I'm going to linger here a little bit longer. Oh, I know that in my life and, and, and all the things that are going on, I just want to linger here. Some of y'all have gotten in more trouble in your life because of the fact that you've just lingered in that place where the Lord says no longer should you be there. And if you notice what happened, the Lord literally, physically had to take those angels, grab a hold of this family and snatch them out and take them outside. Did you see that? Did you see what it says there in the Bible, that the, verse 16? While they lingered, the men took hold of his hand and grabbed a hold of him. I wonder how many times God has grabbed a hold of you and took you out of places that you wanted to linger in too long. I mean, you know, you, some of you should have been in jail by now, but, but God grabbed you out in just the nick of time. Some of y'all should have uh, been pregnant or you should have gotten somebody pregnant. Some of y'all should have had this happen. You should have been in, uh, uh, you know, wherever that, I mean, all of those things that should have happened in your life because of the results and the actions that you did, and yet God was very merciful to you. Anybody know what it's like when God snatched you out of some places? Anybody ever been snatched out? Maybe it's just me. You don't have to say amen to that. Because some of y'all little perfect Christians and stuff who've never gone through things in your life. I know that God has never had to snatch you out of any places. But some of y'all sinners up in here, y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Where if God had not snatched me up out of that place, if God had not rescued me, if God did not set me free, if God did not kick me out when I should have been there a little bit longer, but one more moment, if I would have saved, my whole life would have been destroyed, but God snatched me up. I, I am thankful for God snatching at times. Amen. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, just as much as you snatch somebody's weave out their head, God will snatch you up out of places that he needs to get rid of you. And so here the Bible says that he had been snatched up out of that place, that place that he was so comfortable in. What, what's the Lord going to have to do to snatch some of y'all up? See, I have a feeling that some of y'all have been feeling this little tugging in your life and in your heart. Some of y'all have been, been in places that you knew, oh, I shouldn't be here. I'm lingering just too long. And God's been pulling and and kind of swaying, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit has been knocking at your heart and saying, hey, that's not a place for you. That's a dead place. You need to get out of there. That's not, you don't belong here anymore. This is not home. This is not where God's promises and God's protection and God's provision is. And you linger, and, and finally God is like, hey, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling you. I'm moving you out. I'm, I'm getting you out of this place. And so the reason why sometimes it's hard for us to move past our past it's because we like lingering a little bit too long. Here's the last thing, and I'll close with this. The reason why we need to put the past to rest, no matter what, is this. We'll never have a future by living in the past. You cannot move on. Husband and wife who are living in a continual state of argument, you cannot move on by living in the past. You and your kids, and you've got so much resentment and hatred, and you said something, they said something, you cannot move past that by living in the past. You will never be able to make peace with your past until that time comes. Verse 17 says it this way. It came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Don't look behind you. Don't look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Verse 23. And the sun had risen up on the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. And so he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Everything behind her was being destroyed. Everything behind her was dead and gone. Everything behind her was a dead place, a ruined place, a place that had no hope, no future. Everything behind her was meant to be in the past, 
But she could not get over that, and she kept looking, and she kept feeling, and she kept wondering, and then she turned around, and she looked back. Why? Because her heart was stuck in that past place. Her life was stuck in that past place. Her emotions were stuck in that past place, and she could not move forward because she was always living in that past place. The command of the Lord was real simple. Leave and don't look back. The commandment of the Lord for some of you who are so stuck in your past and stuck in all the things that are associated with your past, the Lord's command is simple. Leave and do not look back. Why? Because everything behind you is dead and gone. If you are the same person that you were 20 years ago, then friends, you are living in some dead places. If your relationship to God is the same today as the day that you got saved, then you're living in some dead places. If you want to move forward with the Lord past the shame and regret and, and stains of your life, you cannot continue to look backward. You have to look forward to the provision and the protection of, of Almighty God. And so he says, leave, don't look back. Why? Because the past is dead and, and gone. Some of you and your family, you will continue to live in, in all of that stuff because you're not leaving the past behind you. So some of you, when it comes to, to, to just experiencing God's freedom from, from, from the stuff that you've gone through, you'll never be able to move forward continuing to be stuck in the past. We'll never have a future by living in the past. We'll never continue to see God's blessing by living in the past, by not going ahead and moving forward with the Lord. Hebrews 8.12 says it this way. He says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. And so the Lord says, You know what? I'm not going to remember your sins, your transgressions, all those times that you lived in dead places. When you come to me, I can forgive you and I can give you a new life. See, peace only comes from the Lord. I want to show you something, and Heather, if you could show us this, this first picture. A buddy of mine was, was going, and he had a property next to him, and, and this property was just, just in a huge mess. And so he went to this property, and he began to just clean out this property. And one of the things that he said to me, said to me in a text, he says, How can anyone live like this? It's vile, disgusting, unsanitary, putrid, not livable, and downright despicable. And you can kind of see on this picture of just all the trash and garbage that is actually at this person's house. And they're cleaning out not only the outside, but the inside is just about the same way. And so these are folks who are living like that. And so in the middle of him just looking and saying, how can somebody live like that? How can this ever happen? How can all this trash get piled up? All this stuff from the past, all this used up stuff, all this old stuff. How can it just like litter the ground everywhere? Friends, I have a feeling, though, that some of your lives look just like this picture. You see, for some of you, you've got more junk and more trash from your past and more stuff that you're not, not willing to, to let go of and throw away, and you're holding this huge amount of just piled up stuff that you just can't let go. It's always in your life. You're having a conversation with somebody. It always comes back. You're just trying to move on, and it's just always haunting you in the back of your mind. You're living like this, this pile of trash in your relationships we can't ever have a clean start we're always fighting and fussing and dealing with stuff because we always have all this piled up stuff but in the middle of him cleaning out some of this trash in in his neighbor's yard he comes across this picture and you may be able to see it he looked kind of close and i know some of you like feathers and stuff that are your reminder but in this puzzle piece time we saw he saw two puzzle pieces as we're going through this series of messages, like all the things that the Lord could have kind of brought his attention to out of this big old pile of trash, he sees these two puzzle pieces. And these two puzzle pieces, he, he says something along these lines. Then it hit me. From their birth to adulthood, their, their puzzle was never complete. There were pieces of their life and upbringing that were missing, mainly Jesus and parents with moral compass guided by the Holy Spirit. And so in the middle of their life and all this piled up trash and all this stuff that's going on, the reality is that there was a missing piece. It had been missing from birth, from their past, from the things that have happened in their life. There's some missing pieces to, to not be able to put all these things together. But that part of that reminded me of a buddy of mine who recently gave his life to Christ. He's been baptized here at the church. And a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, he, he put this picture on his, uh, on his Facebook. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, man, that's, that's my whole sermon series wrapped up. And, and Heather, you can put it on there. It's this piece right here. You see, this is what we're talking about. 
That in your past, you've done some things to fill some of the missing pieces of your life. Man, if I had more drugs, if I had more people, if I had more relationships, if I had more of this, and then all of those bad choices have equaled a, a pile of trash that is built up in your life, and it's like, I can't get past that. I keep looking for that one missing piece, that thing that'll fulfill me, that thing that'll finally satisfy me. For those people in Sodom, they were like, man, if I could have this sexual relationship, if I could have this man, if I could have this thing happen, if I could have these things, and they're thinking to themselves, that will finally make me happy enough, and I can finally get that place, but they stored up all of this wicked to wickedness to where the Lord says, no, judgment day is coming. And for some of us, we have tried to find every puzzle piece, every missing part, everything that we've filled in our life, but the one piece that is actually missing is the piece that you can't buy, purchase, you can't fix it, you can't earn it, you can't do anything. The missing piece is in this picture. The missing piece is a relationship with Jesus Christ. The hole in your life, it is not ever going to be filled by a woman, by a man, and by the past mistakes of relationships that you've made. It will never satisfy. It will not be the newest drug, the newest vehicle, the newest thing, the newest that, the thing that I could buy that would finally get me to this place in life where I'm satisfied and I'm fulfilled. That thing will never quite fill that gap. The missing piece in trying to find peace with your past Peace with your present, and even for our graduates, peace with your future. The missing piece that keeps all of the other pieces together and keeps you from making one mistake of trash in your life after the other is to find that missing piece, which is Jesus Christ. And friends, today I'm going to tell you something. This preacher ain't got a whole lot to offer to you. Man, if I could, I'd be like, oh yeah, you know, this, this church, so God will bless you from the... Top of your head to the bottom of your feet. He will bless you financially. I, I, you get a new Cadillac and you get a new truck and then you get a new this. You know, that, that I can't, I can't, I, I'll write a check, but it might bounce here and there. It ain't going to work. I can't offer you anything. Riches and gold I have not, but what I do offer you is this. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, the only one that can satisfy and fill that missing piece in your life, his name is Jesus. And today, if there's anything that I can offer to you in those missing places of your life, before you make one mistake after the other, is to say this, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I believe that you are the risen Savior. Jesus, in every missing puzzle pieces of my life, I've realized that it can never be satisfied or fulfilled by anything else except for Jesus. And friends, today, if you don't know him, if you don't know my Savior, if you don't know my Jesus, if you don't know the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who is not only the one who came, he died, he died for every one of your sins, but then on the third day he rose again. That is my Jesus. He is a Savior. He's a satisfier. He's a God who's able to heal and deliver and set you free. His name is Jesus. He is Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega. He is God. He is the only one who can ever satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. And today, the Bible says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, you call on the name of the Lord. It's broken and empty and unfulfilled. You call on the name of the Lord. And he says, I give you the greatest peace that will ever fill that void in your life. I give you Jesus. Today's the day that you need to give your life to Jesus. Today's the day that you need to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Today's the day that you give everything to that risen Savior. Would you bow your head for just a moment? As our heads are bowed and as our eyes are closed, we want to take a moment, even those of you watching online, want to take a moment this morning I wonder which picture you are today. Maybe it's that picture of all of that pile of trash, and it's like, how, how am I living like this, and how can I ever get this out of my life? And it seems like there's a missing puzzle piece. Maybe today is the day that you just simply say, Lord, I believe that I need Jesus. I believe that, that he's the only missing piece in my life that will ever satisfy me. And Lord, today I believe that he died and he rose again on the third day to give me eternal life. Today I put my faith and trust in him. Whether you are in the balcony today or on the front row, some of you just today will be the day that you need to say, I give my life to Jesus right now. In fact, while nobody else is looking around, and for a moment, even those of you watching online, you can do this as well. While no one's looking, and this is just between you and I and a relationship with Jesus, and I just want to talk to you while nobody else is looking. If you're saying, you know what, I, I need to have Jesus in my life, that missing piece is him and and. And preacher, I don't know if I need to come down today, but, but whatever it is, I know I need to give my life to Jesus. I've been lingering in some lost places. Preacher, today I need you to be praying for me. So while nobody else is looking around, if, if you're like, you know what, I, I, I know you're talking to me. I need to give my life to Jesus. While nobody else is looking around, if that's you today, would you just raise your hand? I want to just pray for you today. If you're saying, you know what, I, I know it's me. 
I'm the one that needs to give my life to Jesus. I'm the one that needs to be saved and even be baptized. And I just, it's me. I'm the, I'm the one. Thank you for that. Anyone else today that says, you know what, uh, I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm just, I just want to pray for you. I'm not even going to call you by name in front of these folks. I just want to be praying for you today. Thank you for that. Fathers, we come today. I just pray, Father, for those who have given their life to Jesus Christ even today, who said, I need to give my life to the Lord. I need to surrender my all to Jesus. That, Father, today that they would just call upon the name of the Lord. And here in a moment, Father God, that they'd even be willing to just come and come down the, the aisle and, and come to the altar and say, Preacher, I, I gave my life to Jesus today, and I, I want to follow him even today. He's been the missing piece in my life. But Father, I also pray for those believers here today who may have never totally surrendered everything and they've never made peace with their past. That God, today that you'd help them to see that as they turn away from those things of old and they turn their face toward Jesus, that God, you give them hope and life and even peace with their past. And so Father, today we just surrender this to you. We thank you. We thank you that you are able, even today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, Brother Drake, and I will be at the front. We need to pray for you as we sing this song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. We pray that you would do that even today. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the same. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory. death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there for us sin no more hath the minion for more than conquerors we upon Jesus look full in his wonderful faith and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace sing this with me amazing grace Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see last time turn your eyes turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Friends, I want to thank you all for being here this morning. One quick reminder, the seniors and the graduates and their families, there's a meal prepared for you in the Coastal Hall. You are all welcome to come. Also, 
Thanks for joining us today at Westside Emmanuel Baptist Church, the church that loves God and loves people. We want to invite you to come and join us every Sunday morning at 9.15 a.m. for Bible study, 10.30 a.m. live.